On February 20th in 1962, John Glenn became the first American and third human to orbit the Earth, and he did it in this vehicle, the Mercury capsule aboard the Atlas LV-3B rocket. It's hard to overstate how daring this was because the Atlas rocket was not exactly the safest thing on the planet at the time. It has a one and a half stage configuration. It has a uh, main stage and then two boosters that feed off of the same tank as the main stage. And so it had to be very lightweight. Here's footage of a non-Mercury Atlas launch that went awry in 1960. Among the problems with the rocket was that because it was a one and a half stage rocket, uh, it had to be extremely lightweight and so it's, it was structurally unsound sometimes and it also had extremely high g-loads because it got to orbit in only five minutes it went through six g's and nine g's it also had combustion instability which might have been what happened there it had issues in Mercury Atlas 1 where the capsule was just too heavy for the lightweight body and actually collapsed it a bit. And this is Mercury Atlas 3 where the guidance system went awry and couldn't do the pitch and roll program. And so it essentially became an uh, ICBM aimed at Florida. So the range safety officer had to push the red abort button. Uh, a little bit reluctant to do that. He eventually did it and we'll see that happen here. Uh, the launch escape system, by the way, was tested on a separate rocket. There are no humans on board this right now. This was an unmanned test of the Mercury Atlas system. And the capsule was recovered. The launch escape system worked. but And they reused that capsule, by the way, for Mercury Atlas 4, which was the same sort of unmanned test that they were doing before uh, putting a monkey on and then putting John Glenn on. Uh, basically, it went like that. Unmanned, monkey, and then John Glenn. So, yeah, a tough rocket to deal with, very daring to go there, but that was the rocket that the Mercury 7 were aiming to take into orbit, and here's John Glenn. Here's some audio from Mission Control 12 minutes before the start of flight. Okay, this is from Utah. Go ahead. Uh, we would like to hold a 7 and rerun a beast sim. Uh, we lost our main power on the computer, and we just want to check that nothing else has gone wrong. Uh, Roger, have you got your power back? Roger. What do you estimate? Somewhere between five and ten minutes, Cape. Can't you expedite? Make it five. Oh, Roger. And hurry up. Roger. Some of the stuff on the tapes isn't really confidence building, but they really were doing this for the first time, and so they really had to make a lot of stuff up as they went along. But to here we are with the Mercury Atlas launch. I'll have the real audio running for the five minute duration of the flight, if you'll uh, forgive me. This is the shortest flight to Earth orbit that I've ever had on this channel. Control center recorders to fast speed. Uh, Billy, go retract now. Range operation, go, clear to launch. Mercury capsule, go. All pre start panel lights are correct. The ready light is on. Eject Mercury umbilical. Oily light. Rider scope is retracting. The scope is retracted, light is out. 19 seconds and holding momentarily. Roger. Firing signal. Thomas. 15 seconds. Team Godspeed, John Glenn. 10, 9, 8, 7.
I could not see the tower go. I saw the smoke go by the window. Yeah, we can find staging on DM. Roger. Still have about one and a half G's. Programming over. There the tower went right then. Uh, have the tower in sight way out. Good. Could see the tower go. Edison Tower is green. I did. One and a half G's. Roger, 7-0, reading a loud and clear, flight back, what's good? Roger, auto retro jettison is off, emergency retro jettison fuse switch off, or retro jettison fuse switch off. UHF DF to normal. And so there you go, that's how John Glenn made it to orbit, up to 6 G's at the end of the booster stage and uh, reaching about 9 G's at the end of the main stage. So a pretty rough ride for him, but uh, here he is and let's hear some of his observations in flight. This is Friendship 7, the head movements cause no uh, sensations whatsoever. Feel fine, uh, reach test, I can hit directly to any uh, spot that I want to hit. I have no problem reaching for knobs and uh, have adjusted the zero G uh, very easily, much easier than I really thought I would. I have excellent vision on the uh, charts, no astigmatism or any malfunctions at all. Uh, this is Friendship 7, uh, having no trouble at all eating, uh, very good. In the uh, periscope I can see the brilliant blue uh, horizon coming up behind me, approaching sunrise, over. Uh, Roger, Friendship 7. You're very lucky. You're right, man. This is beautiful. Uh, this is Friendship 7. I'll try to describe what I'm in here. Uh, I'm in a, a big mass of some very small particles uh, that are brilliantly lit up, like they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're around the little... They're coming by the capsule, uh, and they look like little stars, a whole shower of them coming by.
Uh, they swirl around the capsule and go in front of the window, and they're all brilliantly lighted. Uh, they probably average maybe uh, seven or eight feet apart, but I can see them all down below me also. Uh, negative, negative. They're very slow. Uh, they're not going away from me more than maybe uh, uh, three or four miles per hour. They're going at the same speed I am, approximately. They're only very slightly under my speed. Over. Uh, they do. They do have a different motion, though, from me, uh, because they swirl around the capsule and then depart uh, back the way that I am looking. Are you receiving? Over. There are literally thousands of them. Uh, this is Friendship 7. Uh, am I in contact with anyone? Over. They were mystified by those little particles, but it was either water from the coolant system or little paint chips or little debris from the spacecraft itself. And you can read all the details of the analysis in Appendix D of the mission report, which is linked in the video description below. Well, this is Friendship 7. Uh, at 45 more seconds, I'd like to have you send a message for me, please. Over. Roger. I'd like you to send a message to the director of the Space Shuttle Program Center and the Interestingly, the astronauts were not actually paid very well at this point, but I don't think that was the main concern on John Glenn's mind because he was about to do his retro burn for descent and the cape was worried that the heat shield was actually loose because they had a warning light about that and so they wanted him to keep the retro boosters strapped on to the capsule and we'll see that in a sec that they're actually strapped on and hoping that that would keep the heat shield in place. California, this is Cape Flight. Go ahead, Cape Flight. Uh, we'd like to leave the package on at least through Texas. So keep, tell him to keep his retro jettison switch off. Three seconds, Mark. All right, up. understand, Cape Flight. He's looking good. Roger. Uh, John, leave your retro pack on uh, through your pass over Texas. Three Three seconds. Roger. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven, six, five, five, four, three, two, one, fire. Retro fire. Roger. Retros are firing. Oh, Roger, baby. DC Con, take it. Zero nine. Feels like I'm going back toward Hawaii. Don't do that. Do you want to go on the East Coast? So they decided to keep that little booster strapped on there to the heat shield so that the heat shield wouldn't come loose. But in fact, the warning light was the faulty element in this whole thing. There was no problem with the heat shield and uh, they didn't have to do this. And it turns out that during re-entry, that little booster pack would come loose and uh, John Glenn would uh, uh, see explosions and uh, be a little bit worried uh, that the uh, debris that he saw flowing past the window was actually his heat shield. But uh, that was not the only problem on this flight, by the way. Uh, John Glenn spent the entire time fighting with a yaw thruster malfunction. His gyros, which is the equivalent of the nav ball, were constantly going off and he had to judge his attitude by the horizon. Uh, so the heat shield warning was just one of many things that uh, caused him problems. But he made it. He made it back down uh, safely. And so we see here re-entry. Uh, parachute deployment at 6,400 meters in altitude and a splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean. And so all that was left for John Glenn was uh, a parade, many parades, uh, plenty of welcomes, and of course uh, uh, standing next to the President of the United States, which was at that time John F. Kennedy, and uh, of course being congratulated for the return and eventually running for Senate. 
Oh, and a certain space shuttle flight, but we'll cover that on a different date. So, thank you for watching. This was John Glenn's flight on this date in 1962 on Mercury Atlas 6. Thank you to Frizank for the Mercury Atlas rocket model, and see you next time.